I had made the decision to try to get into movies. And I have to say, I'm not one of those people who watched movies as a kid and, and loved movie music. I didn't know beans about movie music, barely. I went to see movies because I thought movies were entertaining, you know, which I think was actually a good thing because I never forgot that most people go see movies to be entertained. They don't go to hear the score. Um, the reason I went into movies was because I had somewhat of an epiphany driving up, I think it was La Brea Avenue, be, while I was still in school, trying to figure out what I was going to do for my career. And I thought, what sort of music would I like to write? And something was on the radio. There was a song. And I'm 20-something, 20 21 or whatever. And I'm, you know, dancing around to the song. And I thought, I'd like to do that. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to, I'd like to make people feel good with their music. I'd like to make people feel something. It wasn't even feel good. I'd like to have people feel something. So within a couple of seconds, I worked the whole thing out. I thought, oh, should I be a songwriter? And I thought, no, that's too short. Uh, I'd like to write something of bigger length, something where I could get a lot of people together that, that could be affected by the movies. They get them in dark rooms, they pile them in, and you get to play all this, and it makes people feel. So that was what I looked for. Um, unfortunately, because of my background, which was certainly not motion pictures, the Salvation Army is a long way from that, uh, I didn't know anybody. I wasn't related to anybody. I mean, it was it was like trying to establish a colony on Mars, you know. But my grandfather had a friend who had been a um, well-known radio producer. Well, even that was not too close because radio was pretty much gone. I mean, dramatic radio. This is 1967. Yeah. So um, I called this man up. I, I knew him. Uh, I'd known him since I was about 14 because you know, he had known me as a kid. And he talked to me and he gave me advice and he gave me the names of several people to talk to, all of which I did. His best advice was, uh, don't pay attention to anything I'm saying to you, just do anything you can think of. Well, let me give you a tough one. Um, I'll even name him, uh, Peter Himes. Peter Himes is a, um, when I work for him, you know, Peter is a really serious filmmaker. He's a smart guy and he knows pretty much what he wants to do. I did three films with him. Uh, actually, I sort of did four because the first movie I did for him wasn't, I mean, he was producing it. That was Monster Squad. That was how we met. Fred Decker was the, was the uh, director, but, but uh, Peter was the uh, producer. Um, the first film I did for him was uh, Presidio. And he was very specific about what he wanted. When we got into the scoring, there were things he liked, things he didn't like, um, things that were to change, and you know, that was that was like regular stuff. That's not a big deal. You just you make your changes. When we got to the next movie, Narrow Margin, I already had experience of working with this guy. Uh, I knew that you had to pay attention to him. I knew that he was very specific and very articulate, and um, so he told me beforehand. He said. I want such and such and so and so, and I want you to do this and this and that. I went, okay, fine. You know, so I, I translated. He means this. He means that. You know. So when we got on the recording stage, I record. I rehearsed the first piece. I thought it was great. He didn't, and he came out, and he never came out on the stage. And he came out on the stage that day, and he said, "This is 180 degrees from what I wanted." I said, "Really?" So then he told me again what he wanted. He told me exactly what he had told me a month before. I just hadn't been paying attention, you know? So I, I interpreted, I translated for him, but actually he meant exactly what he said. I mean, he meant exactly what he said. And I just had not been paying attention, you know? And here's where, here's where I really, I mean, I learned a lot from him. I really, I mean, this, there's a little voice in me saying, don't name names and all that kind of stuff. But I have to say, I'm really grateful to him because I learned a lot from him. He was a really serious director. And so what I had, I had this whole film scored. We had five days booked. I'd written the music. We had the guys booked, you know, and, and, and he doesn't like it. So what do you do? So the first thing you do is you go out and you change it. Okay, horns, bar four, don't play that. Uh, trumpets, uh, let me give you some new notes. Clarinets, don't, you know, you do that kind of stuff. And some things, you know, you just sort of have to rewrite because it's just not going to work at all. So I'm going home and I'm rewriting this and all that. And uh, at one point... Um, I looked at him, I was in the, in the dubbing stage, I looked at him and he was just looking kind of dejected because you know, this wasn't, this was too hard. And I said, you know, Peter, I said, well, you know, there are th you have three choices here. 
you can either, this is me, you know, big Bruce, say, well, you can either um, let me continue doing what I'm doing, changing whatever I can and, you know, change a few things, or uh, let me go home and I'll rewrite the whole score, or you can just hire somebody else, you know. And he turned, he just, he whipped at me and he pointed at me and he says, that's not an option. You screwed it up, you fix it. And I went, whoa, oh, okay, you know. Well, you know, how many, you know how many directors at that point would say, I'll take option number three, thanks, get out of here. You know, I mean, that happens all the time. Scores get dumped. Not from this guy. This guy said, it's your job, you messed it up, come on, you fix it. Okay, so I did, I did. At the end of it, he liked it. You know, it went in the, okay, it's not exactly the score that I thought I was going to write, but it's the score that, you know, that he accepted. He liked it. And he's the guy, you know, so, I mean, I learned so many, so many things from him. I mean, one, one time, um, Mark McKenzie was working on that thing too, you know, and as my orchestrator, and I think he was trying to get points or something like that. I don't know. For me, he was trying to do a nice thing. So he said to Peter, he says, you know, Bruce really worked, I don't remember what movie it was, Bruce worked really hard on this, and he was up late at night, and he was you know, putting all the hours, and Peter looking and says, I don't care. And Mark goes, huh? He says, we all work hard. We all stay up at night. We all work like that. And I'm thinking, yo. <laughs> I mean, that, that to me, I mean, it's hard. You know, it, it's hard to take that stuff. And when a guy's that, you know, that specific, but when he's that right, you, you, you have to say, well, thank you for saying that because you're right. I mean, I, I've heard so many composers whine about their lot in life. They don't understand my music. You know, my agent doesn't understand my music. The director doesn't know anything about music. Blah, blah, blah. They don't love me. You know, yeah. Sorry, it's his gig. You know, you're not there for your music. You're there for the story. And if you can't get the story going with your music, you're the wrong guy or you're doing it wrong. The director has every chance, every option to say what he wants to say because it's his gig. It's not yours, you know. When the director says to you, I want it to be more, and then he gives you a word, whatever that word is, this is what can make, you know, uh, composers crazy. But it's the part you better listen to because what he's saying is, I want it to feel like. And you have to do that with the instruments. You pray to God that he's not musical. You pray that he won't say, I think the trumpets should be, because you know, then, then you're screwed. And he's probably screwed too. But if he'll just say, I need it stronger. I need it, I need it to resonate with the fact that he has a prior hmm, with, you know, relationship with that. You know, you know. And you go, oh, okay. Okay, how am I going to do that? How am I going to, okay, that, if I use the mandolin and I use the guitar, but I put the mandolin below the, you know, and if I use it, that's where your mind starts to go. It's not like divulging secrets. It's just you're creating a fabric of sound that will help tell the story. That's what we do. So this is what Bruce does. This is a, a cue from um, Heart of Darkness video game. This is with an orchestra. I devised this paper. So I have three lines up here. The top line I always use for flutes that have the stems going up and oboes with the stems going down. The middle line is for clarinets. I use one whole line for clarinets because they have a huge range. Sometimes they play in the bass. Sometimes they play up in the top. The bottom line is generally for, for uh, bassoons, low clarinets, whatever. The next three lines are given to the brass. The top line I give to the trumpets. The middle line I give to the horns, which I write out in alto clef, not in treble clef, because I can keep all the notes on the staff. I learned that from Prokofiev. Um, the bottom line then is, is trombones and tuba. Then I have four lines for piano, harp, choir, guitar, mandolin, ukulele, whatever, you know. Um, and then the next three lines are for strings. The top line are for the violins. The second line is for the violas because they have their own clef. And the bottom line is for the cellos and the bass. And then the bottom three lines are given to percussion. Um, you can see that they're written out so that I can have a single line like a snare drum or five lines for timpani or mallets or something like that. This is my score. This is my sketch. I begin with this, I end with this. The only problem with this is as I get older, I can't read them any longer from a distance. I need my glasses. But this is, I mean. But it's so complete that you essentially don't need. It's not so complete. It is the whole thing, John. This is the whole friggin' score. So um, a couple of months ago, we did a, um, we did a concert of game music. And Heart of Darkness is a game. Heart of Darkness is the first orchestral game. So um, 
I put together a suite from Heart of Darkness. And so for that, I had to construct my own parts. So I took my scores out and I put them into Sibelius because now we have software that does that. I put them into Sibelius and was able to construct parts and had my whole score. All the notes came right from there. I'd already done the work. Now I was just doing inputting and I was too cheap to hire somebody to do it. You know, So I do it myself. I, said, I, th I find it fun. So I, I do it myself. But that's what I do. That's my orchestration. Now, the good thing about that is that um, I don't have to worry about somebody changing what I did. The bad thing about that is that I might be able to hire somebody who knows more than I do and they might be able to do me some favors, you know. Um, but, you know, if I make a mistake, frankly, I want to fix it myself because I want to learn. Favorably. <laughs>